many readers have asked why I began telling stories of the sea and writing books on the subject. I believe it is because all of my ancestors on the male side for eight generations were sea captains, except my father. Also, early in life I purchased a canoe that enabled me to visit islands and lighthouses in the vicinity of Winthrop, Massachusetts. The town is a peninsula almost entirely surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean, which gave me countless opportunities to go ashore at many points of interest. At times, I would travel by canoe as many as 40 miles from my Winthrop home. It is possible that more people have learned more about the history and folklore of the New England coast from Edward Rowe Snow than from any other person. From his early career as a teacher, through his years as the author of over 50 books and countless publications, as a radio and television personality, lecturer and tour guide, photographer, treasure hunter, and flying Santa to lighthouse keepers, Snow's varied life had one central purpose, the gathering of the facts and legends of the Atlantic coast and the sharing of that knowledge. All of my ancestors, except my father, were sea captains. Mm -hmm. They hailed out of Rockland, Maine for very, well, I should say over a century. And before that, we go back to the days of the pilgrims. Snow was exaggerating only a little on that 1967 radio program. His ancestry can be traced to Stephen Hopkins, passenger on the Mayflower, and his daughter Constance, who was 15 when she arrived in the New World. Constance married Nicholas Snow, a prominent landowner, and their family was among the first to settle in the eastern area of Cape Cod. Isaac Snow, great-grandson of Nicholas, was an early settler of the Maine wilderness near Harpswell. And Israel Snow, one of the line of sea captains, was a co-founder of the South Marine Railway Company in the 1850s, which later became the well-known Snow Shipyard. As important as this legacy was, it was Edward's mother, Alice Nichols Rowe Snow, who was most responsible for stirring his imagination as a boy. Alice was born in Rockland in 1868. Her father, Joshua Rowe, was a sea captain who had fought pirates in the Philippines. In this recording made in the 1950s, Alice describes to her son the beginnings of her years at sea. And my mother was around Cape Horn. When did you go? Well, we went around twice. We went around the first time in 80. Three, and the second time in 87. What were you on? The Bark Russell. Why were you on it? I was the captain's daughter and he took me. <laughs> he took my mother too. I went to sea first when I was 11 months old. Sure. I can't remember anything that happened that voyage. But my mother said later on I learned to walk at sea. And when I got back to the shore to live a while, I couldn't walk because the ship didn't roll. Mm. <laughs> As a girl, Alice kept diaries of her adventures on the coast of South America, on Robinson Crusoe's island and other exotic locations. She illustrated these diaries with her own pencil sketches. Later, in the 1940s, these diaries were published as two books, Log of a Sea Captain's Daughter and more stories from the Log of a Sea Captain's Daughter. Alice once received a zither from a government official in Chile, and it was her zither playing that first attracted Edward Sumter Snow. Alice and Edward were soon married and moved down the coast from Rockland to Winthrop just before the turn of the century. The ancestors of Ed McAuliffe did likewise. There were at least six families that moved. Uh, they picked Winthrop. It could have been that uh, Winthrop was a resort town and uh, probably very similar to the Rockland coast. And, when you, once you live near the sea, you'll love to stay by the sea. The Snows settled in a house referred to in a 1932 article as a cozy home hung like a swallow's nest on the eaves of a hill. Edward Rowe Snow, the third of their four sons, was born in that house on Cottage Avenue in 1902. In Snow's 1962 book, Women of the Sea, he wrote, Ever since I can remember anything, I have been able to recall my mother's zither and my grandmother's guitar being played in our spacious Winthrop parlor. 
The earliest stories I can recall are of mother's adventures at sea and ashore in foreign lands. Both my mother and her mother were women of the sea. Anna Merle Snow, Edward's wife of nearly 50 years, recalls his relationship with his mother. He adored her, and uh, I think he, in, he sort of inherited her interest in entertaining people. She used to give lectures, and he gave lectures. And uh, after he, he had written his first book, she decided that she would write her book about her life. So they influenced each other. William Merriman is the author of Winthrop Beach Memoirs. The Merriman family had a fish market at Winthrop Beach on Shirley Street for over 30 years. And uh, during the latter 30s, when business was pretty tough, I spent a lot of time looking out the window there, watching people go by. And the Snows are quite prominent, the whole family, his father and mother brother and his wife so I saw a good deal of them and they always impressed me as being very very optimistic confident people Alice Snow was a, a small woman lively and cheerful as they all were uh, she was a parishioner of the Congregational Church on Tuxbury Street for years and years one of the leading members of the church. In 1952, Alice Rowe Snow wrote the history of the Winthrop Congregational Church. The first people who came to Winthrop Beach, she wrote, lived by the sea because they loved it. And when the Sabbath came, they worshiped God in one of their homes by the sea. Throughout the chapter, she referred to the church as a ship and to the ministers as captains. Edward's grandmother, Caroline Keating Rowe exposed young Ed to many historical sites around Boston. He wrote of one of their educational jaunts in 1970's Great Atlantic Adventures. As I remember it, we took the narrow gauge railroad from the Winthrop Beach Station to the East Boston Ferry Station. Soon we were in the tunnel under Boston Harbor. We continued underground to the subway station at the corner of Tremont and Boylston Streets and went upstairs to the sidewalk where Grandma took me into the Boston Common Cemetery. The stories behind the ancient graveyards of New England became one of Snow's favorite subjects. In fantastic fact and folklore, he wrote, One of my earliest thrills, now approaching 60 years ago, was in accompanying my grandmother to the old state house to read through the great masses of reference works and scrapbooks there. Old documents still fascinate me. In 1907, on a steamship with his family, on the way to a summer vacation in Rockland, Edward, for the first time, saw Boston Light, the oldest lighthouse in America. This, and many other sites along the coast, accelerated his growing passion. At 12, Snow read about Edward Bendel, inventor of the first diving bell in the 18th century. Inspired, young Edward would dive from the shores of Winthrop, breathing underwater with the help of a rubber hose and five-gallon cans. In Ghosts, Scales, and Gold, he wrote, Thanks to the help of my older brother Winthrop and our father, I could swim on and below the water, and soon was diving under the schooners that came into Old Lewis Wharf near the Merriman Fish Market in Winthrop. At high tide, I would dive from the wharf, swim under the keel of the schooner, and come up on the other side. A tragedy off the shores of Winthrop in 1917 left an indelible mark on Snow's consciousness, as he wrote in 1960's New England Sea Tragedies. On the night of March 29, 1917, the 23-foot motorboat Moxie left Stone's Wharf in Lynn at about 9 p.m. Less than two hours later, shortly before 11 o'clock, Winthrop residents walking along the beach heard shouts for help coming from the ocean. The 13 boys on the Moxie never returned to their Lynn homes, and the realization soon came that they had all probably drowned in the surf off the Winthrop shore. 
on the afternoon of April 6th, just as our country was declaring war on Germany, my chum Tom Johnson and I began to walk toward the beach to see if any sign might be found of the missing boat. To our surprise, we found that the bodies of the boys were washing up on the beach. I will never forget the pitiful, heart-wrenching scenes which took place as the identifications were made. This event may have marked the beginning of Snow's fascination with shipwrecks and the human drama associated with them. One day when I was a sophomore in high school, Joe Berry came up to me and said, Ed, I want to sell the canoe. You can have it for $30. And I didn't have $30, but I had 10 so he took it. And I finished paying for the canoe about four months later. But by that time, I had visited almost every island in Boston Harbor, and I had become so interested in the graveyards there, in the secret tunnels at Fort Warren, mm -hmm. and in the lighthouses such as Boston Light, which is the oldest lighthouse in America, and Long Island Headlight, and locations like Nix's Mate, mm -hmm. where lifeless remains of pirates were strung up in chains. <laughs> With an increasing appetite for adventure, Edward Rowe Snow set off to see the world. He traveled extensively as a seaman in the forecastle of a tanker. He visited foreign ports and eventually found himself in California, where he worked for a time as an extra in Hollywood, once appearing in the same film as Lon Chaney. In 1928, after spending some time back in Winthrop, Snow entered Intermountain College in Montana on a scholarship. It was there that he met Anna Merle Haig. I was going to school there, too. Now, I was interested in another young man at the time, but he uh, and Edward was interested in another young lady. So eventually, I started on the track team, and Edward was a very good track person. He was good at high jumping, so he taught me how to high jump and through that I think is how we really became interested in each other. During his two years at Intermountain College, Snow worked as a lifeguard at the world's largest natural indoor pool. He also set the Montana State high jump record. After graduation, he returned east to attend Harvard, while Anna Merle attended Rockford College in Illinois. He did have some help from the Winthrop Women's Club. He, they gave him a scholarship and, a, you know, a certain amount of money. And he also did all kinds of things to earn his way through Harvard College. Snow's research on the islands of Boston Harbor intensified during his stay at Harvard, where the history of the islands became the subject of a thesis written under the tutelage of Samuel Eliot Morrison. Morrison had already achieved acclaim as perhaps the most important historian of the New England coast, writing such volumes as the Maritime History of Massachusetts and the Story of Mount Desert Island. Morrison may have influenced the structure and historic content of Snow's writing, but their personalities were not always compatible. Morrison looked down on Snow as a person who had attended public schools and had to earn his way through Harvard. I remember that he was uh, on the he was at Harvard and they came to an elevator. Edward was already on the elevator, but he held it for Mr. Morrison. And Mr. Morrison waited and waited and Edward said, Sir, do you wish to go up? And he said, Yes, when you get off. So Edward had to get off the elevator so, <laughs> the, so that Professor Morrison could go up first. Snow, however, had the last laugh. I remember later when both Professor Morrison and Edward had uh, sort of uh, displays of their books at the Boston Public Library, and Edward was quite amused that uh, people were more interested in his books than they were in Professor Morrison's. Snow took a heavy course load at Harvard to shorten his stay there. I graduated in two years, and he graduated in three. So I taught a year in Montana before uh, 
before he sent word that he was graduating and would he and would I please uh, set the date for our wedding. We were married on July 8th, 1932. Joe Kolb was a friend of the Snows in later years. The one thing I remembered him telling me, and he said, I told this to Mrs. Snow when we first were engaged, and it's a very good measurement of what do you want from a lifetime partner, which is what they were. Uh, he said, all I ask of you is that when I look behind me in the canoe, I see you there. He said, I don't care if we have to eat out of Campbell's can beans for, for a while until you learn to cook, but I just want you to be with me. And I think that says everything about their relationship with each other. Edward went back to Montana to pick up Anna Merle, and the return trip to Winthrop was memorable. He had bought a car on the way out to Montana, thinking that it would save some money because the uh, train was so expensive. So we went in this car after a time, a certain distance. It was very, um, it was very hard because he had never driven before, but I didn't have to have a driver's license in Montana. They n just didn't have such a thing at that time. When we came to New York, the, it, it, the uh, police saw me driving, and so they thought, well, we might as well get somebody and see if she has her driver's license. And, uh, of course, I didn't have a driver's license. So they had one count against us. Then they said, are you driving on your husband's license? He didn't have a driver's license. So we really had quite a time. We had to leave the car there, and uh, we came home the rest of the way by bus. Edward was anxious to introduce Anna Merle to his hometown. He was delighted, and he wanted to show me everything. I think it wasn't more than a couple of hours before we were in the, the water. He loved to go swimming, and so did I. The Busy Snow household, with four sons and a constant parade of friends and relatives, took some getting used to on Anna Merle's part. Everybody would talk. The, the brothers would all uh, try to be... The, the loudest, <laughs> so it was very noisy. I couldn't understand this way of life very much because I was a very quiet person. She did adjust, playing her guitar to accompany Alice's zither and learning to canoe so she could accompany Edward on his expeditions in the harbor. We went out to Snake Island first and then Apple Island and then we went to Governor's Island all from Winthrop. Andrew P. Quigley, publisher of the Winthrop Sun Transcript, summered at Point Shirley in Winthrop in the 1930s. As youngsters, we were, at the time, eight or nine-year-old youngsters, and we'd see what appeared to us this giant of a man with the canoe on his back coming down, and naturally, as youngsters, we'd run down to see him and so forth. We, we knew who he was. Everybody knew. Edward Rowe Snow and Winthrop and his wife. And uh, off he'd go, paddling out from his end of the beach down near the sandbar. And uh, it wasn't long before he started uh, taking us on, uh, on little trips with him in the canoe. Two or three of us would be there. And uh, mostly around the harbor, uh, the bayside we called it at that time. John Domenico is the former principal of Winthrop High School. I can remember his being out, it looked like he was out in the middle of nowhere. That hulk of a guy in a tiny, tiny, uh, you call it a canoe, I, to me it looked like a little kayak. And uh, just, he could practically lift it out of the water. Watching the surf at Winthrop Beach during storms was a popular pastime. E. Arthur King of the Winthrop Improvement and Historical Commission remembers one such storm. Behind the waves crashing uh, into the wall, on many feet in the air, 
who was Edward Rose Snow, in a canoe, taking pictures from the other side of the waves. Now, I don't think that, in my mind, has ever been emulated by anyone I know. You wouldn't believe it, but you know those great big storms when the water goes up 100 feet into the air when it hits the wall? Edward and his brother went out in the canoe in a storm like that. And when they got there, out far enough so that they wouldn't be drawn into the, uh, into the surf, then they took a picture. And the picture was on the front page of the Boston papers. And oh, was it dramatic. Even on calm days, canoeing on the ocean could be dangerous. On the way we, to Nahant, we did see this shark, and I didn't know what it was. I, it was just this little thing sticking up out of the water, and I had no idea. And Edward said, that's a shark. He says, hold very still. So I held very still. And do you know what he did? He took the paddle, and he's uh, accustomed to, to uh, making a noise with the paddle. He was very good at canoeing. So he took the paddle and he slammed it down on the water and it sounded just like a shot. So he did it several times and the shark went off. The Snows had spent the first year of their marriage in Athol, Massachusetts, where Edward taught in the high school. But he was restless so many miles from the coast. And in 1933, he was thrilled to secure a position in the Winthrop school system. Over the next 13 years, he taught English, history, and mathematics in the high school and junior high school. He also coached football and track. Ed McAuliffe's sister, Anne Gaudette, had Snow as an English teacher. And it was an amusing class, and I think every one of us loved it. We kind of looked forward to going to his class. I mean, it was more history on the islands, and probably than the English language itself. Uh, United States history with Edward Rowe Snow, as we know him now, uh, is Ebo Snow, was something really different. Uh, he departed from the usual procedures of teachers in that he did a great deal of verbalizing in his class, and he expected his students to verbalize. Uh, he was one of the teachers who insisted that he would read to us, but then he expected us, in turn, to read to him and to the class. And I always thought that was very kiddish at first, until I realized that there was a method to his madness. Uh, he was making us feel familiar with the, uh, the spoken word and almost forcing us to tell picture stories. And he just loved it if we imitated him. Ed McFarland, captain of the undefeated 1938 track team under Snow, and later track and football coach himself, and Bob Reamer, sports columnist for the Winthrop Sun Transcript, recall their association with Snow. What Evo used to like to do in the outdoor season was he liked to go off there and high jump with us. And of course, he must have weighed at that time over 200 pounds. He was a big man. But uh, uh, he, he could still jump the old, uh, what they call the old Eastern form, pot scissors, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was fantastic. He was really great. And then, in the, of course, I, I played football, and he was a JV coach. Right. And he was quite a punter. Oh, geez, he could really boot that ball. I never saw a bad left-footed kicker anyway. He was a left-footed punter. And uh, I could kick the ball fairly well. So that's what we used to do really in practice was have a contest kicking the ball. It was fantastic. Well, I remember him most in the classroom, and he was my geometry teacher. He tried, as I think I wrote in that 82 column, that uh, he tried to teach me geometry. I don't think he was very successful at it, but... He was one teacher that you would Oh, you mind. know all the angles. What are you talking about? <laughs> I knew the angles with him. I could tell you a story that's a little embarrassing to me. Uh, but he, uh, 
He was one teacher that you wouldn't mind staying after school with because he regaled you with stories of sunken treasures and the islands. And there were very few people that I was associated with that said they didn't like to go to Mr. Snow's class. Uh, there was always something going. Uh, he was he was very erudite, a very good scholar, very widely read. Uh, he could tell stories to illustrate his points at the drop of a hat, and as treats, he would tell us stories about the islands, and that's, I think, where he excelled, and that's where he captured all of us and, and just kept us enthralled for, well, as long as that class period ended. And if we could get through the history work early enough in the class, we were sure to get some of these stories, uh, the ghosts, the mystery people, the, uh, or the happenings on the islands that he just brought alive. There was, there was something about him, the way he told us. Uh, he would frequently darken the room to make certain that the effects were there. And to see this hulk of a man uh, emote before the class, I tell you, he just uh, left us with a, a lot of, a lot of great memories. I had him as a, Edward was a mathematics teacher. Uh, he's a happy man, but could be pretty stern. He's a big man. He, of course, his athletic ability uh, showed that. He's also very proud. Uh, with all the accomplishments and the deeds that he had performed, uh, he could have easily been a bragger, but uh, more than he, he did not brag, he shared. John Domenico remembers a favorite ploy of Snow's to maintain order in the classroom. Snow would leave the class in mid-lesson, returning a few minutes later, and would mysteriously identify those who had caused trouble in his absence. Took us probably half the year before we realized what he was doing. And that was to go out into the hall, march around, make sure that we knew he was out in the hall and away from the class. And he could stand at an angle, and because the uh, classroom doors were, well, all of them contained a window, he could look into the window from an angle and read what was going on in the room, and uh, invariably he would, he would catch us. And we thought it was a great game to see if we could outsmart him, but uh, invariably he came out on top, one way or the other. And uh, while it was a game, we we liked playing the game with him. I think because we we liked him. There were signs that teaching was not to be a lifelong career. I don't know how he, he lasted so long teaching, as I know his mind was elsewhere, that you know, there were things that were more important to him. As happy as he was, and as a good teacher as he was, uh, probably like a, like a little boy, I, I, it looked like his mind wanted to be out at sea. But Snow was in his element when he had the opportunity to take students on field trips to the Harbor Islands. I feel very fortunate that I did make one of his ocean cruises that uh, we went out to uh, Thompson's Island where Farm and Trade School was and uh, Edward engaged uh, all the pupils in a game of ping pong. You know, he annihilated them very quickly. <laughs> we, had a, we had a track beat, uh, I don't know, probably the first in, the, in any high school. We went by boat to Thompson's Island. And we had a track meet against Thompson's Island out there. Uh, it, it was fantastic, the, the boat ride and, the, and then the track meet and then coming back. Thank God the weather was good. You know, nobody got seasick that I recall. Mr. Snow organized uh, a trip where we would go into the, uh, uh, the inner harbor and then out into the outer harbor. And as we went by these various islands out here, uh, we went to Spectacle Island and uh, uh, George's Island, all of the islands uh, out here in the harbor. He would tell at least one story about that island. And uh, here again, I think that uh, 
he created a situation for our youngsters where they became so much more curious about what we had surrounding us here in the town of Winthrop. Snow also organized Saturday trips to the islands and other points of interest. We would go out uh, to the government pier, which was down off Shirley Street, on one of the government boats, and it cost all of 25 cents for a trip. Well, in those days, 25 cents was kind of an expensive thing, but somehow or other, I always managed to make most of the trips and we'd go over to the islands and one particular island they had this underground dungeon or jail no windows just you saw a door kind of a steel door and it was probably a steel uh, shed and uh, he would send all the girls in after we all got in he said look around tell me what you see and as we we're trying to look around he slammed the door on us which was a just shrieking and horror. We were petrified. No lights, no nothing. Was there rats in there, spiders, or what? He finally opened the door, and he thought that was the biggest joke. Well, it, for a few minutes, we didn't think too much of him. But it was funny when you think back on it. Snow's Harvard thesis on the islands of Boston Harbor was expanded and published as his first book by the Andover Press in 1935. The islands of Boston Harbor was a success especially to the people of Winthrop. It was thrilling for us, of course, to see, because uh, we knew him and rushing down to have him sign an autograph, a book, and uh, was a was a thrill for us. And he uh, gave a gift to me, uh, was a copy of his first book, Islands of Boston Harbor, and I happened to check it out today. It was copy number 372, signed by the author, and uh, that uh, it was quite a thrill to me to receive that as a gift, you know, as a young young man, because here is an author, you look up to authors, and suppress the fact that he was my coach. Although Snow put countless hours of research and writing into the islands of Boston Harbor, it was by no means a one-person production. I remember the first time when he was doing that first book, we would go up to the Boston Public Library and sit. We had a, a regular place that we would sit in the hall. It was seat number 134 and 5. And we would meet there if we didn't happen to go in at the same time. So um, then Mr. Snow would get some deeds or something of the sort, and he would bring it to me, and I was to copy because they didn't have Xerox in those days. It also very proud of the fact that most of his books, his wife, Anna Merle, would edit. And it, was a, it was a team. I'm sure she had a great deal to do with his career as a writer, putting together the scattered and fragmentary stories that he collected from everywhere. Uh, she was a partner, really. I, I would say she had a great deal to do with it. I don't think he could have made it without her, or would have. I did uh, some of everything. I did the copyright uh, uh, letters and so forth. I um, would correct. I would do proofreading. And finally, I would do the index. The Islands of Boston Harbor was well received in the press. The Boston Transcript critic wrote, a better combination of realism and romance could not be offered than that furnished in this book, and went on to point out that Snow wore out nine canoes in his countless hours of exploration about the harbor. And the Boston Globe said, Mr. Snow has done a truly remarkable job in preparing this work, and his skill in writing enhances its value. Edward Rose Snow was becoming a hop property. In 1934, he had lectured on the history of the Harbor Islands to the Bostonian Society, and he became more and more in demand as a lecturer. I remember in 1934 was one of Edward's first lectures. He had a, a very strange little slide machine, and uh, I remember he showed a picture of, uh, it was about the islands of Boston Harbor, he showed a picture of me in a white bathing suit. <laughs> and the, 
these people at the Bostonian Society were, <laughs> they were delightfully uh, complimentary, shall we say, about this lady in the white bathing suit. But he told the stories of Boston Harbor, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. In the late 30s, Snow began to regularly publish volumes of various sizes, including the story of Minus Light and Sailing Down Boston Bay. As if he wasn't busy enough, in 1936, Snow assumed the role of Flying Santa, taking over from Bill Winkapaw the yearly flights he had begun in 1927, dropping presents to lighthouse keepers and their families each Christmas. Snow was able to maintain this tradition for over 40 years. He received notoriety in other ways as well. We lived right next to the tower in the, in the house that was uh, the first one down. And we loved it because it was such a beautiful view. But the boys used to climb up that cliff and it was, it was really very dangerous because after they got so far, sometimes they couldn't go up or down. And uh, this boy, this day, called and called, and we heard him. And uh, Mr. Snow went out, and he, he tied uh, a rope so that uh, it would help him coming up, because it, it was impossible to go down from there, from the place where the boy had reached as he had climbed the, the real rugged cliff. So he had the, the line tied, I don't know what it was tied to, but to something very sturdy. And then he went down on the line and helped the boy up. We have pictures of him as he, uh, as he reenacted the scene. The poor boy was scared to death, and it, he did reenact it for the, the people to take pictures of it, <laughs> believe it or not. Then he received the citation from the Humane Society of Massachusetts, which was very nice. Of course, Edward had been reading about all these people who had received the uh, certificate or the medal from the Humane Society, and uh, so when he received it, it was an absolute shock to him. He just had no idea, because of course he didn't think of it as being heroic or anything. He just saved this person's life. Snow also became known for his daring dives. Several times he dove 65 feet from the roof of the Winthrop Yacht Club. His uh, father had promised that he, Edward, would dive, but he didn't consider the tide. And you know how the tide gets low there <laughs> by the yacht club. So Edward went out and had some of his friends, and they, they took uh, clam forks, and they dug and dug and dug about where he would land until it was about nine. There was nine feet of water, and he dove from from the, the, the roof of the club down into that small area. <laughs> By doing that, he, uh, he probably increased the gray hairs in a lot of parents' heads because a lot of kids have tried to emulate him by diving off that same area. Snow's burgeoning career was interrupted when the U.S. entered the Second World War. It was an interruption of his own choosing, however. Mr. Snow was, at the time of the outbreak of the Second World War, too old to be drafted, and he was unfortunately, as he put it, too young for World War I, so we had volunteered. Snow enlisted in the Air Force and became a reconnaissance photographer. When he first went into the observation squadron, this was before he went overseas, and before he went to Miami to be in the um, in the school down there to make him into an officer. 
he went, uh, he was lonesome at night and he could see the lights of, of Winthrop from the airport. So he wanted me to shine the projector from our attic window looking out over Boston Harbor. Well, there happened to be a blackout and <laughs> apparently someone noticed a light flashing one, four, three, which is I love you, according to Minot's light. And as he was, as I was flashing this, apparently someone called the Fort Banks or somewhere like that and told them that somebody was signaling in Boston out to, to the airport. I didn't know anything about this for a long time about the fact that we were being questioned. After a time, I had a visitor, and the visitor seemed to be asking questions about Boston Harbor and about the defenses in Boston Harbor. And I said, you, I wouldn't tell you anything like that. I don't. Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to tell you anything like that. But they persisted. And finally, I called Fort Banks and told them that somebody was asking me questions that I didn't feel they should ask. Well, that ended that as far as I knew. But later on, several years later, the man who owned the house where we were living said, uh, we went up into the attic to, to look at some things I had up there. And I told him about signaling to my husband, I love you, when he was at the airport. And he looked at me with the strangest look on his face. And he said, was that what it was? And I realized that we had been uh, considered, it had been considered that we might be doing something we shouldn't be, that we were giving away secrets to the enemy by signaling in Boston Harbor. When Snow learned he was being sent to the North African campaign, he and Anna Merle said their goodbyes in a canoe in Boston Harbor. After a shrapnel wound, Snow spent several months convalescing, first in Oran, North Africa, then in England. It was delightful for me when he came home. I could really see that he was all right and that we were going to get along. Anna Merle had taken over Snow's classes while he was overseas. Edward resumed teaching in the junior high school in 1943, but he was becoming more and more involved in activities outside the classroom. He had little time for the details of teaching. Harriet Stevens was a student of Snow's and later his colleague as an English teacher. Homeroom teachers had probably more clerical duties than they have today. Uh, Stanford achievement tests, Pintner IQ tests were uh, administered uh, cooperatively through the guidance department, but the homeroom teachers were expected to correct these by hand. Mr. Snow uh, offered me copies of his books as they were coming off the press if I would do the correcting because he heartily disliked uh, doing this nitty-gritty type of work. Snow resigned as a teacher in 1946. He received letters during his life saying he was the reason for their interest in history. Snow's output as an author increased steadily after his teaching career ended and Winthrop's history provided material for many of his stories. In 1949's Strange Tales from Nova Scotia to Cape Hatteras, for which Snow walked 1,158 miles to research, he told the story of the mysterious woman in the purple cloak who, in 1868, came to Point Shirley in Winthrop on an omnibus carriage. She told a young boy, Wallace Wyman, that it had been revealed to her in a dream 
that treasure was buried in several places at Point Shirley. Wyman himself never found any treasure there, but years later, he found three men sitting around an old sea chest full of gold and silver. They had found the treasure in the exact spot where Wyman had stood with the woman in purple. Wyman later lived at Point Shirley in the pilot house of the old ship Columbia. Snow met him in 1936. Some of the most interesting evenings of my entire life were those I spent at the old Point Shirley pilot house. One night, Wyman told me the story of the woman in the purple cloak, and he told me that treasure has actually been found in each of the places she mentioned. Although Edward and Anna Merle moved from Winthrop to Marshfield on Boston's south shore in 1950, the town of his youth was never far from Snow's mind. Dorothy, their only child, was born shortly after they moved to Marshfield. My, my memories of Winthrop are going there for Christmas or Thanksgiving when, when uh, you know, for, for family get-togethers and maybe having Thanksgiving dinner and then going for walks afterwards in between when, you, uh, when you've had enough turkey and uh, walking, him walking along the seawall, talking about the jetties, talking about how we used to swim there proudly talking about the water tower and uh, how he used to live there. But um, we never spent much time there. It's, it, was, it was hard to get there at that time without the expressway. And um, he was happy down here. His, after his, his mother died, I don't think he really spent much time going back there. But he always spoke fondly of Winthrop. He obviously enjoyed it while he was there. I think the last time we saw him here in Win here, not in Winthrop, because we, it was up at Caruso's in Saugus, was at the testimonial we held uh, for you uh, early in 1970. Yeah. And he very graciously uh, agreed to come. At that time, he was down in Marshfield and, and writing a column for the Quincy Patriot Ledger. Uh, I even remember <laughs> part of the story that he told at that testimonial. Where he used to come up with these things, I don't know, but he, he said uh, there were two Scotchmen that lived in Winthrop, uh, one many years ago who was a fantastic uh, track man by the name of Macintosh, and then he went on to tell about all the exploits of, I never heard of Macintosh, I don't think he, he probably never it. I don't think he ever did either. <laughs> And then he said, and then the other one, because another Mac, he said, uh, Ed McFarlane. And then he went on, and, but he was, en it was enjoyable, yeah. fantastic. Well, yeah. he was a storyteller. He could uh, really enthrall a group. Well, uh, I had an endeavor to restore the E.B. Newton School clock and the weather vane. And Edward Rose Snow assisted me. He uh, 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 wrote to me. Uh, that he would help me. He called it a timepiece. Uh, I have a, uh, that letter today, and I cherish it very much. Edward Rose Snow died in 1982. He was honored in Winthrop three years later when the Winthrop Beautification Committee installed a memorial planter at the foot of Cottage Hill near Winthrop Beach. That was beautiful. It was nice that they remember him. It's all, I'm always pleased that there are people who still do remember him. Many Winthrop residents were present at the dedication ceremony. It was pleasant to be there. It was a beautiful little ceremony. It was no great statue. Uh, I have often thought that I, I wish it were possible to, to have some kind of a, uh, a more memorable type statue or a bronze or a head or something like that of some of the uh, students uh, or teachers at Winthrop High School that have done so well over the years and that Edward Rowe Snow should certainly be in that so-called little local hall of fame of, uh, of ours in Winthrop. Those who knew Snow in Winthrop all have their favorite ways of remembering him. Edward was uh, never walked that I ever saw. He always strode. He was uh, over six feet and very well built athletic man. I always walked with that confident air, optimistic, confident air. It's also part of the fact that he appeared in Who's Who in 1943. He opened the book in class and he said, if you look across from my name, Edward Rose Snow, you're going to find an up-and-coming crooner by the name of Frank Sinatra. Edward Rose Snow was uh, 
just one of those individuals that you remembered so well because he was prominent at a time when the mention of somebody in the Boston papers or doing the things that he did were so important uh, and the fact that we knew him as youngsters uh, of course thrilled us completely. Give him a roster and give him a, uh, a podium and away he would go. He, he'd be at home in, in just about any company too. He could fit into a group very easily. Uh, those were good days. Snow is also remembered as a central character in Winthrop's history. He's probably one of Winthrop's favorite sons, really. Uh, he did a lot to put the town on the, on the New England map. He put us on the map, both literally and figuratively. Winthrop has had a number of well-known people in different fields, sports, and so forth, but uh, his, uh, his books have brought more attention to Winthrop than any other one thing. Winthrop, uh, 50 years ago, was a beautiful little seaside community, and Edward Bo Snow and his wife uh, was, were certainly a part of it and a prominent part of it. Snow never published any poetry, but he once wrote a poem about his hometown. Why journey again to Winthrop, with all the world to roam? Perhaps it is the wave-lashed shore, the great rocks dashed in foam, the seagulls gliding with outstretched wings as they soar in flight, or possibly the lighthouse gleam with its flash on through the night. Each bit of town, each hill and cove combine in harmony. That's why we go to Winthrop, to Winthrop by the sea. Edward never stopped loving Winthrop. It was his first home. He really loved it.